because those of you who've studied World War II history and are familiar with Maryland, they called up their reserve militia and people volunteered to guard the shore. The reason they did was saboteurs came ashore from submarines and also off the Atlantic coast they were sinking ships. So the fear of invasion was, I don't think a case of paranoia, was a real fear because of what was going on in World War II. So they used the body of men at large at that time. They brought their own guns and they guarded the shore. So in case of an emergency, it is still a valid guarantee. Now, when it comes to uh, so-called assault weapons, as one of my professors used to say, in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. And so you go to the U.S. District Court for the Northern Mariana Islands. <laughs> and I cited it right there for you to help. They struck down the assault weapon ban. They said, look, these attachments, such as a pistol grip under the action of the weapon, a thumb hold stock, a folding or telescoping you know, stock, a flash suppressor, and a forward pistol grip. That's nonsense. Semi-automatic firearm is a semi-automatic firearm, regardless of the cosmetic attachments that you attach to it. And so the judge there, God bless her soul, uh, she struck it down. The government of the Northern Marianas did not appeal. They also had a case there called Radich versus Guero, again from the Northern Marianas. There they would not give you what in Illinois you would call a firearms identification card if you listed self-defense as a reason. The court struck that down. Also in the Murphy versus Guerrero case, <coughs> They had a $1,000 excise fee on pistols. The court struck that down as well. So the Northern Marianas have given us some favorable case law. Now what about switchblade knives? Uh, 2015, Wisconsin Court of Appeals said that a switchblade knife is a constitutional now, a switchblade knife is simply a folding knife, and the only thing that is modern about it is they added a spring, which makes the blade come out. In 1984, I filed an amicus brief in a case called State versus Delgado before the uh, Torga Supreme Court, and using their state constitution, which guarantees the right to bear arms for defense of self and state, they also struck down a switchblade knife law. And they use the same rationale. The addition of a spring to a folding knife does not mean that it comes from under the constitutionally protected umbrella. Now, there's one gentleman here from uh, Connecticut, which I chatted with. This is a case called State versus Decisio, 2014. The question is, is a dirt knife and a police baton a constitutionally protected arm? Connecticut Supreme Court said, yes, it is. Both dirt knives and police batons are protected arms within the meaning of the Second Amendment. So what you have now are stun guns, switchblade knives, dirts, batons. By the way, when it comes to batons, uh, your California Court of Appeals said that they are not constitutionally protected. So you do have to split, please. Now, again, uh, Michigan Court of Appeals, tasers and stun guns are constitutionally protected. Now, what about a pump-action rifle? For those that are not familiar with pump actions, they also call them trombones. They go like this. Okay. In a case called State, New York State Rifle and Pistol Association versus Como, the Second Circuit struck down a ban on the Remington 7615 pump action rifle of 223 caliber. It did not have an accentuated pistol grip. It did not have a forward pistol grip. It was a run of the mill pump action rifle. Now, what upset the legislature was that a magazine that could go in was one that could be used on the 
AR-15 and it was a 223 caliber. And even for the second story, they said no. They uh, spread that part of the wall down. Again, they applied intermediate scrutiny. And this is one of the things that I've noticed about the courts when it comes to this right. Except for one exception, they always apply intermediate scrutiny. I don't care if it's possession inside the home or carrying outside the home. It's always intermediate scrutiny. And what you have to show with intermediate scrutiny is that there is a valid state reason for doing this and that public safety obviously and that the fit between the reason and the remedy is basically a good fit. It doesn't have to be a perfect fit. Just basically a good fit. Now when it comes to intermediate scrutiny, uh, some courts uh, apply the label intermediate scrutiny, but when they actually do the analysis it's rational. Your uh, Delaware Supreme Court, when they applied intermediate scrutiny, I call it robust intermediate scrutiny, and they struck down the law, and of course that will be discussed later by our speaker. Now, what about magazines? Well, there's a difference between a clip and a magazine. A magazine is a box or a drum that has a spring and it holds ammunition. A clip is simply a container to hold ammunition without a spring. A good example would be the M1 rifle with its eight round clip. There is no spring, it's just a press fit. And that's the difference. But in any event, there's one 2019 decision now in the Southern District of California that magazines holding more than 10 rounds are arms and that a ban on such magazines is unconstitutional, not only under the Second Amendment, but also violates the taking clause of the Fifth Amendment. Now, before you start, those of you that are defense-oriented, <coughs> support this way before you start doing cartwheels, remember California's in the Ninth Circuit. In the Ninth Circuit, and I'll discuss this a little bit later, Whenever you get a favorable opinion from a three-judge panel, they go and bonk, and they reverse the three-judge panel. Uh, they are pretty hostile to the civil right, and I have a feeling that Duncan versus Macaria, when it goes up to the Ninth Circuit, they're going to be reversed. Now, what about carrying outside the home? When you look at the whole United States, there are essentially six outliers. California, Hawaii, New York, Massachusetts, New Jersey, and Maryland. All of the others are shell issue, which means that as long as you are a law-abiding person, you are of age, and you've taken some training, you can carry a gun outside. But what about the District of Columbia? Is it shall issue a may issue? The statute is a may issue. However, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit said, no, no, no. This is essentially a ban. We struck it down, and now in the District of Columbia, I know several attorneys that have licenses to carry in the District of Columbia. And while in Maryland, I cannot carry in the District Columbia, I'm a member of the bar, I want to carry a pistol in the District of Columbia and be able to do so. So again, that's why I chose that provocative article back in 1983 for the version of judges. Now, there's a case called Young versus Hawaii. Hawaii bans the carrying of a firearm either openly or concealed without a license. They do not issue a license except in an extraordinary case, which means in one of the big counties in Hawaii, they have zero licenses. Zero. That's how stringent it is. And so it went up to the <coughs> Ninth Circuit, and one panel struck down the law. And said, okay, the case
can't carry concealed, but you can't carry openly either. And so they struck down the law. Now, what happened? Um, Rehearing and bond was granted, but they haven't ruled yet. And there's a reason for it. You have pending before the United States Supreme Court a case called New York State Rifle and Pistol Association versus the City of New York. <coughs> Oral argument will occur on the 2nd of December before the U.S. Supreme Court. It is a transportation outside the home case. Because don't forget, both Heller and McDonald involved inside the home, although there is excellent dicta it says it is not restricted to outside the home, we just don't forget. It said hunting, sensitive places, which means you know, outside the home, and also they cited state cases that said you can carry openly, but you can't carry concealed. That is not restricted to the home, obviously. Now, your uh, neighboring state of uh, Maryland. They upheld Maryland's good reason required to get a license, which means that it's pretty difficult to get. And they told the Supreme Court, in this dicta, if you're going to say that it allows the carry outside the home, you are going to have to say it, Mr. U.S. Supreme Court, with greater clarity. Well, I guess maybe they'll provide six outliers with greater clarity within a few months. In that New York City case, in order to get a license in New York, it's practically New York City at least. It's practically impossible. Now Donald Trump had a character license, and you know a few others did too. But that uh, applies, you know, to the power elite, not you know to the people on the bottom rungs of the socioeconomic ladder. And so, if you have a premises license. Take your gun outside to seven ranges. In order to take them out to the seven ranges, the gun has to be unloaded, secured in a locked case, and separated from your ammunition, and only to those seven ranges. <coughs> but what about if I want to take it out to a range outside of New York City? No, can't do that. What if I own a second home outside of New York City and I want to take it to my home? No, I can't do that. It is the only such law in the nation. It is an outlier. Don't forget, both McDonald and Heller were outliers. This is also an outlier. And so they granted cert. Now, there may be a small wrinkle in this case, and here's why. The District of Columbia, when they lost in the DC Circuit, they decided to file for cert. And there were people who told them, don't, you will lose. You have an outlier case, the court is changing, scholarship is changing. Don't do it. Nonetheless, they apparently felt that gun prohibition is a religion, and the Constitution is the work of the devil, and we're going to go ahead and file cert. And that was a big mistake for them. So what New York City did, learning from that experience, they decided to change the local ordinance, and in addition, the New York State Legislature decided to change the statute as well. So what's happening is that the respondents are arguing that this is moot. There's no point in listening to 